Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, the automotive therapist, here along with Matt Allen, the KTR car guy, and we are here to help you with your car every Saturday from 11 to noon right here on 92.3 KTAR, putting you in the know when it comes to car stuff and hopefully lowering your anxieties about one of the most expensive purchases you have. So today on the Bumper to Bumper Road Map, can I replace just one tire at a time on my all-wheel drive, open phones, and when do I part with my car? <laughs> well, when do I part with my car? When does it make sense to uh, replace that car? I know that's a question that you have to get it all the time in the transmission the business because that's a big repair, even though I know you guys fix a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be replaced, but we get it too. Engines, transmission, some kind of big repair. and. When's the right time? I mean, I know you get it all the time, Dave, but I I was listening to Dave Ramsey on the way home Tuesday night. He's got an opinion about car payments, of course. He, you know, for those that don't listen to Ramsey, financial guy. You, here's, you, here, you, you told me that I have. And were you to up. invest the equivalent of a car payment, four hundred eighty-four dollars over eighty-two months right now, according to the National Auto Dealers Association? Were you to invest that from age thirty to age seventy in a decent growth stock mutual fund? that you'd have $5.6 million. And you stop and think, I don't really like my car $5.6 million worth. Well, there's the opinion. <laughs> well, I, I, I Anti, do. Mr. Anti-car payment, or anti-payment anything for that matter. Well, a vehicle, it is one of the largest purchases you'll make. It's your house. That's the guy before us. And now it's your car. That's us. And it is a major expense and a major burden on your life. But that is what's going to rob your wealth more than anything, is a car payment. I mean, he says $484 from 30 to was at age 65, if that was invested, that money. But really, I, you can't take a whole car payment because it still costs you money to, to maintain your old your. Although maybe you can take the whole car payment because when you're making that $484 car payment for 84 months, I can't imagine, you still should be budgeting that $100 a month. Yeah, you still have to you spend know, that money to maintain it. Because we did talk about that a little bit. Well, you can't take the full 484 or 500 bucks, let's just call it, when the payments are done because you have to be budgeting. 100 of that. Well, and that's a but good point still. because a new car still takes tires, still takes brakes, <laughs> still, needs oil still takes oil changes. All and that the reason we're having the question at the transmission shop is that, let's say the car's worth three to $5,000. A transmission repair, the average automatic transmission, maybe $2,500. For, for an good, overhaul. For a good quality, you know, overhaul remanufactured transmission. And people say, why? Why would I spend $2,500 on a car that's only worth $3,500? And they said it would be completely bad, you know, not a thing to do, but it's, it's, counter in, it's counterintuitive. Because we look at use value. How much does it cost you to get in your car, drive to work every day, drive home every day, take the family to church on Sunday? What does that cost? I mean, there, you, you have to, you there's need a cost something. And there's a value. I mean, there, there really is. It's, it's, so the it's, way I look at it, because sometimes these questions come, I have a, let's just say, I'm going to use a 2005 Tahoe right now with, 130,000 miles on it. That's about what we're seeing. And the transmission repair they're faced with is $2,500. The vehicle probably has a $5,000 value. They say, why would I fix that? 130,000 miles, why wouldn't you fix it? Well, yeah, unless you are just shopping because you want a new car, but so many people have this knee-jerk reaction to think, I'll just get rid of it. Well, sometimes that's okay. You want a new car, treat yourself to a brand new car. I tell, that's why I tell people, if you're going to go buy a brand new car and you can afford it, by all means, treat yourself. But what we see a lot, Dave, is like an engine replacement. Someone burns up the engine, maybe because they weren't doing the maintenance they should have been doing, mm. and that's why we're having this conversation in the first place. But I'll take another example. Take a $5,000 car that needs a $5,000 engine. Is it worth it? Well, yes. If Now, if you're in the business to buy and sell cars, no, absolutely not. You're not going to make a profit if you're a car salesman. But let's take that $5,000 car again before the or after the engine blew up. It's not worth $5,000 anymore. It's worth $1,000. It's worth a grand. You can get a grand for it. So now you take the $5,000 that you have in savings, and you take the grand that you sold for your, your car with the blown motor for, and you take $6,000 and you go buy a used car. Which possibly may have the same problems. Same problems, but I tell people you're not going to get a new. You're not going to get a used car for six thousand dollars that has a new engine, new belt, new hoses, new 
uh, radiator, all the stuff that we do that goes along with an engine job to do it right, especially one that no, maybe you put a new set of Michelins on it three weeks or five months ago. Maybe you had a brake job done last year. Well, this is the one thing I think about. Now, you are considering doing an engine on this $5,000 car. You're going to do it. If you are going to do it, I want you to do it right. If you can get it done wrong for uh, $3,500, would you pay five to get it done right? Because when you get a crummy job, a major job like that, you really wreck the car. So I know that wasn't in our topic or our notes, but if you're going to invest in a car to do that kind of repair, you want to make sure it's done right. You don't want to cut any corners because you're talking about $5,000. Well, I see engines you know, on Craigslist for a lot less than that, but we're talking belts, we're talking hoses, we're talking a new radiator, we're talking the all the accessories that go along that with it. that goes along with it. Yeah, I mean, you, I, the last thing I want to do is put an engine in your car and then be cheap Charlie and not replace a radiator that costs two or three hundred dollars and then you're back in six months or you have a blown rate uh we didn't replace the radiator hose because we wanted to be cheap and now you're back here with a blown head gasket or something else happened or you're just broken down and you're thinking to yourself those guys just put a new engine in my car and i'm blah 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 and it's so bad no well that was the cheap job well here's the math that i do and we put on our facebook link go to bumper to bumper.com facebook you'll see we put a link up there that is a repair replace calculator. It's actually a spreadsheet. And the way I, I calculate it out for my customers is, hey, you're looking at spending $3,000. And you're going to drive your car 15,000 miles a year. Next two years, that's 30,000 miles. That breaks down to 15 cents a mile it's going to cost you to drive that car. That's the way I look at it to help create that because it doesn't feel right to spend $3,000 on a $5,000 car. Again, if you're in the business of buying and selling cars, but you're in the business of needing a car. And the first question I like to ask is, before your car broke, were you <laughs> thinking about getting another car? And most people will say, no, you know, it really wasn't. It was a, it's a good car. It does everything I need. It, and it, so that's the first question is, is it practical for your needs? You know, you, bought a, you were in a convertible when you got married. Well, sometimes you just need to get a new car because there's nothing wrong with it. You just need a different car. But, but, but if you think you're yeah. going to go spend $6,000 and go get another good used car... That's not going to happen because every good used car is a car that maybe someone didn't keep up on the maintenance. <laughs> well, that, the good used car that the guy is selling is the is the good is the car that you just want to get rid of because you didn't want to do the maintenance or do that work that you let slip away. And I always tell people if you have a six thousand dollar budget to go buy a car with, you better go buy a forty five hundred dollar car because you got to you got to <laughs> you got to get it. You got to do all the catch up the last guy didn't do. It's like the thing was run hard and and, and now he's ready to move on. So yeah, it's. <laughs> The car, I mean, it's just it all goes to the maintenance and just taking care of it. And then maybe we're just never – the best thing to do, actually, Dave, is just avoid getting in this position to need a new engine. Or, 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 or a new or, transmission. Or, or, and that's the maintenance of the thing is that, you know, just because every time you go to the shop, they offer you something and you don't buy it, uh, you know. And you're working with a good shop that is making you good recommendations. It's not a sales thing. But they're making you these recommendations and you say, no, 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 no. Well, that's all piling up. Yeah. I, I talk to people sometimes. We'll have a 60, 70, maybe 85,000 mile car, and we've been making some suggestions. Hey, you still haven't done that 60,000 mile service. You haven't completed this. And, and there's a point where that stuff starts piling on. And where do you, and then where do you start? Now you feel like, oh, I need all this work all of a sudden. No, it's not all of a sudden. It, it just it gets away from you. That's what I tell the customers. It, it can get away from you. You need to get it reeled in. If you're going to keep this car, you know, I, you could probably go buy a new Honda and not change the oil for 30,000 miles and just drive the thing into the ground, and, and maybe it would last till thirty or 50,000 miles. But you've just now just wasted your money. Well, I think about it. When you don't maintain a car and you do pass it off on someone, I mean, you are giving your problems to someone else. So there is a reasonability to just maintaining your car, doing what's necessary, because that's going to be somebody else's car at some point. But let's talk about the other end of this. $484, put it away in a mutual fund. Ramsey's calculation was five million bucks. Is a new car worth five million bucks to you? Well, it'd be a down payment on the Ferrari that just sold in Scottsdale. You'd have two two and a half two million to go. <laughs> well, you know, I, I sat in on that bid and I, I got up to six million dollars and I had to sit down. Be I couldn't seven point five million for a car is way too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I saw a Money Magazine article several years ago and it took a comparison where they took made an analogy of two car owners that won over 30 years. One got a new car every 10 years, so three cars over 30, and one got a new car every three years. They took and factored in a clutch job or a transmission and a timing belt and all the maintenance on the, th on the three cars over, and then the other one. It was a million-dollar difference if you, if you 
didn't enjoy having that new car. But look what you got for yourself at the age of sixty or seventy. Well, even if you cut that in half, and it's five hundred thousand bucks. Well, five hundred thousand bucks is a lot of money. So, is it worth keeping up with the Joneses for five hundred thousand bucks? I don't think so. So, when we come back, we're taking calls at 602-277-5827. KTR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm a hungover Dave Riccio. <laughs> Are you? Here along with my co-host, Matt Allen, and we are here to help you with your car every Saturday from 11 to noon, and we've got we've got Jeanette, Doug, and Austin up, and we've got a couple open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR, and the reason we were out, Matt and I were celebrating last night, is Edith, his wife, got her citizenship. Uh, she's from Reynoso, Mexico. Reynosa, yeah. She, Reynosa, she, uh, I butchered that. It's been a, <laughs> yesterday was a big day for our family. Had a big party last night. But yes, my lovely wife, Edith, is now a U.S. citizen. It was a After big deal. And she actually years. explained the whole story about her growing up and becoming a doctor. She wanted to be an astronaut, but she decided Mexico didn't have a... Uh, no space program. No, no space no program. Air Force. And she wanted to be a pi- airline pi- or a, a fighter air, pilot. Fighter pilot. And she decided Mexico didn't have a, an Air Force, so then uh, she settled for being a doctor. <laughs> but I'll, it's I'll really it. quite an accomplishment from coming where, from where she came from. She's well, just really to well. accomplish what she's accomplished and then the... Um, and then the citizenship was just great. The ceremony was great. The, down at the federal courthouse, it was very, very nice. And you really don't realize what we all take for granted when you start to hear some stories. And very neat. So it was an exciting day. And I'm surprised you're hungover. I mean, I feel great. I thought this would be a hangover show, but <laughs> we we behaved pretty well. Well, I texted him this morning at like 8:30. I said, "Are you awake?" And he said, "Barely." <laughs> and then it was, uh, you know, we broke out the moonshine at two o'clock, and I thought, "Well, it's a good thing I left early." <laughs> Because that would have been ugly. It was fun. Let's take take care of some cars, though, Dave. What do you think? Well, up first this segment, we've got Jeanette in Mesa on a 2006 PT Cruiser. Go ahead, Jeanette. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, guys. Well, I'm sorry you're hungover because I have a really <laughs> serious problem with my car. Well, it's a 2006 PT Cruiser, um, and it runs really well, but it's like possessed. <laughs> it's possessed. Our favorite. Along, all of a sudden, the windshield wipers, which are in the off position, just go on by themselves, like two or three times, maybe five or six, and then they turn off. Okay. Well, that's. I mean, it's it's it is possessed. There's probably a, a gremlin in there somewhere, but you know, it's probably not all that big of a deal. There's only a couple things in that car. Multi position switch. The, the dash switch. switch, which is a multi switch. I'm not sure exactly if there's a body control module or how the wipers are controlled on that. It might be very simple with a switch and a relay and a and a wiper motor, or there could be a body control module, which is basically a computer that's making the decisions. Probably not that tough to figure out. I would think that uh, any any good auto shop uh, would be able to. They would get out a wiring diagram and they would look at that circuit. And and there's just different you know different branches in a car. So you would pull up the windshield wiper circuit and see what all it all is involved there. And then those are the the areas you'd start looking at. Well, it's just like going on a road trip. You need to go somewhere. You're going to get out the map. You're going to look. I'm here. I need to go here. I'm going to stop here. Here's how we get there. Here's what I expect to find when I get there. Same thing with a wiring diagram. We'll just go through it and figure it out. Well, we were talking before the show about intermittent issues uh, because we had, I believe it was. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on her name now. I believe it was, was it Judy? On the 2004 Ford Focus, she called oh, last week. Yes. And her car would just die randomly, but the light next to the hazard button would come on, and then it would start right back and keep on running. And we had a caller that actually called after the show, and he said, I think it's an anti-theft issue because I had that same problem on my Ford Focus. So she took her to the shop, and they tested it out, and everything worked great, of course, because that's the way <laughs> these problems are. And they said, nothing wrong. You know, so she goes home, and she's not even home back to the house, and it acts up for her again. Intermittent issues. They can be fixed, and they can be figured out. You're just going to have to commit yourself to them when you're working with the shop and just say, here's what's going on, kind of take notes of what's happening. There's nothing wrong with iPhone pictures, so we know which sure. light is coming on. Because people try and describe to me the light they see, and in my mind, I can't, I can't get a picture of it. So they take a picture with your phone, record the noise that it makes, and then show that to the shop and be prepared to 
to leave your car for a little bit. Yeah, it may not be a silver bullet, but anything can help on an intermittent problem. Any little tidbit of information is good information. Give them all of it, and they'll decide what they don't need, <laughs> yeah. and they'll just you know throw that in the, you know, we don't need pile, but they're not even going to tell you what that is. Yeah, exactly. So what do you think, Dave? Carl in Maricopa? Carl, you're up. You're on Hi. I have an 04 Alero that has an overheating problem. Um, it's uh, kind of strange because when, when I'm just driving, it's fine. But if I ever am idling for any length of time, it'll start to overheat. Um, my temperature gauge doesn't go above half when it starts to overheat. And well, if I turn on my air conditioning, not the heater, but my air conditioning, then it, the temperature will come back down. What I believe what we got going on, because you say it doesn't run hot when you're driving on the road, but if you're idling for any length of time, it's, mm-hmm. it starts warming up. When you turn on the air condition, what that actually does is kick in an, an auxiliary electric fan that comes on. It's going to bring the temperature down. So I think we have an electric fan issue where the, we've got a fan on when the air condition's on, but in the normal mode of operation, you know, we may we don't have that. But that hold on, Dave. On. I, I would agree, but I'm a little confused. You said it when it overheats, it never goes over a half a gauge. Is, <clears throat> is that what I heard you say? That is correct. So then, what, what then? What do you mean? It's overheating. If the gate, are you losing water or boiling just, over? Uh, it, it, it will start to, um, like, I can hear it start to boil, and if I let it go for too long, it will boil over, and I'll spill water all over the place. Um, but if I look at my temperature gauge, it'll be like right at the middle, maybe just barely above that. Like that's my danger zone. That's when I know I'm going to be boiling over. If it's at it just below it, I'm fine. But if it's at it and just above, I'm boiling over. Well, okay. That, have, you, have you checked the water level on that thing? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've been pouring cooling into it. <laughs> okay. You know what I would suggest? I mean, this we need to find out is the car really overheating? But something that you can do, you're, you're adding water, just go buy a new radiator cap. Get a good radiator cap and, and put that on the car next time you have to add water. Just go do it today because I think what may be happening is the radiator cap's not holding pressure, so it's allowing the water to boil, and you're really not overheating maybe. Because if it was truly overheating, the, the gauge would, it would register higher in the gauge. So we have a symptom, we have a noise that we're associating with overheating, but I'm not convinced that the car... Well, one of the points I want to make about that, when you are low on coolant you don't have any water to transfer into the temperature sensor. So that will cause an issue. So if we got an air pocket in your system, that can be causing the issue. Uh, on these later model cars, getting the air out of the cooling system has become a more difficult process because we've lowered the hood line. So therefore now the radiator is actually below the motor. If there's an air bubble, where's it going to get stuck? It's going to get stuck in the engine. So as they're making the cars, they're doing more to put bleeders on the thermostat housing or up at the top of the engine so we can get yeah. the air out of it. Or but they don't have a, a radiator cap. They have a reservoir that has a hose, then a bleed hose that goes up to a pressurized vessel, if you will, up on the firewall. And really anymore, we're vacuum filling these cooling systems because we can't get the air out of them. Well, that's what I was about to say. We have a special tool. We suck these things down and draw a vacuum on them. And then a special tool, and then suck the water back in, and then they're full that way. It's about nearly the only way you can ensure that they're full. Well, I think for sure, though, he did. it did sound like he may have had a cooling fan type of issue, and that could be a cooling fan relay that's out or a temperature sensor that is not working that operates a fan. So we could have a temperature sensor issue causing both. Yeah, and the reason the fan it is better when you turn the AC on, again, the f- air conditioning needs a fan. So there's either a secondary fan that's working and the first one isn't, or it's another way that the primary fan is getting switched on. So when we come back, we've got Mark, Tim, Chris, and Austin. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Right. Welcome back to another segment of Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen, along with Dave Riccio. And as always, like every Saturday, we're here talking about cars. So if you've got a car question or anything related to a car that you want to talk about, we're always here. You can always find us on BumperToBumperRadio.com. We're on KTAR.com. We've got blogs up. Always talking about cars. So we're here for you. Oh. Maybe cranky, something cranky, like cranky, that cranky. you got going on this morning. So up for this segment, let's go with Austin in Casa Grande on a 1993 Grand Voyager. Go ahead, Austin. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, that's my sentimental grand voyage, I like to call it. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> um, uh, 
Well, my car, basically what happens when I get out of work, I start my car up and I'll put it in drive, and, like, the uh, transmission won't kick in. It'll take a while. I'll, like, rev it and rev it, and then it'll finally kick in, and I'll be ready to go. But uh, once my car is warmed up, or, you know, it's been cold here lately, once it's warm, like, uh, it'll kind of kick in right away where I don't have that lag. Well, Dave, I know you know the answer to that one because <laughs> we were talking about you did a we did a news story this week on our transmission business picked up with the cold weather. I mean, literally, we had fifty percent more volume in our shop, and it was calls exactly like what you described. It. I start my car, put it in gear, nothing happens. As I sit there and let it run, well, then it it goes to work and just fine. And what is going on is that you know if it was low on fluid, the transmission, and then it gets cold, well, it, it's really low. It's really low now. It's like your tires. Because the, uh, the fluid gets smaller with temperature. So I really do think we're looking at low fluid in your transmission. That's the first place I would go is to check that fluid level. And if the transmission is low, there is a leak. Transmissions don't use fluid like engines do, so it's not going to burn up in the combustion chamber. It's not going to consume any of the fluid, yeah. So if it's low, it absolutely went somewhere. There's definitely a leak. It may not actually be a leak that showed up on the driveway. It may be a leak that went into the radiator. Sometimes transmissions will leak into the cooling system and vice versa. So there could be a couple things going on. But as it warms up, it starts working better. But you could also have not even a low fluid level condition, just hardened old s- seals that I've seen time. The rubber dries and hardens, and it doesn't make a seal and allows pressure where there should be pressure to bypass. And that would be the other thing that I would look at. So if your fluid is totally full, and it wasn't recently serviced where maybe there was an issue with the filter uh, getting installed and there could be like a a leak at the filter, Uh, you may start to be having hardened seals on the inside of the transmission. So what happens is they get hard when they're cold and more malleable and start sealing better as they warm up. So a 93 Voyager, that's not out of the question. That's a big word for you, Dave. Did you get a dictionary? (laughs) Which word? (laughs) Malleable. (laughs) I paid a little bit of attention in science class. Yeah. I get a better grade in auto shop, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. So anyway, up next we've got, looks like, Chris on a 2004 Tahoe. Go ahead, Chris. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, thanks for taking my call. I'm just going to run something past you guys. On that 04 Tahoe, it came on the, on the display service brake system and had it scanned. It come back the control brake control module abs control module so i did some calling around called uh, chevrolet the parts guy i talked to said oh he says oh no that's that's too bad those are those are expensive so i oh, okay tell me how much it is he said uh, uh just a little over a thousand dollars but he said on you know, what we always do is just unplug them so no, no that, that that's that's that, not that's hillbilly repair. That's not the not necessarily the right fix. And are you calling me a hillbilly? Because no. I unplug stuff. I don't want to fix it. We but. were drinking moonshine last <laughs> we night, but were. but no. So, I mean, unplugging it. Why, then you don't have analog brakes there. I mean, that, that that's, that's a, one of the things we talk about. Your car getting away from you. Then the next thing it goes wrong. And then you unplug that, and now all of a sudden you got this pile of Tahoe. My neighbor has an 04 Tahoe, and he's got the same thing going on. And the first thing that we did was go check the grounds. There's a lot of bulletins, a lot of information about bad grounds in relation to that ABS module. And you're looking at a thousand dollar repair. It is expensive. Now uh, I realize if you go to GM and you pay the GM price, that may be what it costs. But there is companies out there who will rebuild them, and I believe it slices that number almost in half. Well, yeah, the $1,000 that he was talking about, that's the cost of just the part, and it's the whole hydraulic portion and everything. We can fix those in our shop. We do it all the time. and We don't see them as much as we used to because most of these have already failed and seen their course. But we can take that brake module apart, take the electronic portion off, and leave the hydraulic portion on the car and go in there and fix bad solder joints. And those bad solder connections or what the problem is. And, and, it, and it does. It cuts that repair in half. Yeah. 1000 bucks just to have ABS brakes. 500 bucks a lot more reasonable. You guys actually solder on boards and stuff at your shop? Well, Charles will fix some stuff. But no, we, we, take, we take them out and we send them out. There's a place that fixes them for shops. So you're not – and then you can drive the car typically while the thing is down too. So 
it's it's definitely worth looking into. We don't have any shops in Casa Grande, but if you go to bumper to bumperradio.com, there are some East Valley guys, and I know they do that kind of work. I believe he was in Bus- Buckeye, not Casa Grande. You're on the last phone call. Oh, Buck- okay. You're, well, we've got some guys on the West, too. His so. moonshine is there, is showing up. They We have bumper to bumper shops all over. So, how about that? East or West, North or South, they're around. Bumper to bumperradio.com. So, up next, let's go with Tim on a 1999 Chevrolet Lumina. Go ahead, Tim. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, you know, I had trouble in uh, with my car in the summer where it wouldn't start. It was like it wasn't like a dead, it was like a dead battery. It just wouldn't turn over. It's like click. And so um, I walked over to a Walmart, which is right next to the place I worked at, and the guy came on and goes, "He tried to jump start." And he goes, "No, it's the engine froze." So I have a uh, repair, you know, a uh, car from uh, it's regular auto repair. Starts with the A. I want to do business, you know. It's got A A A. Yeah. Stuff. Okay. So anyway, so they came and towed away, and they, and this one guy said, "You might want to take that over to such and such, you know, place." But I did the A A thing. Took it over, and they repaired it. And they said that you had a frozen such and such, and this and that, and so I ended up paying. They said my belt was frozen. My air conditioning unit. Okay, that's what I was going to say. You you you're. A lot of people I mean, jump to the gun and think they have a, a seized up engine, and the comp- air conditioning compressor or some other component can freeze, and the belt is so tight that it locks the engine. Correct. So okay, so so they did uh, replace it. Okay. Re- How did that and work then, out? Well, they did some other work, additional work, and they gave me another bid. That by the way, we think you have a uh, leaking intake manifold gasket and a couple other things for two thousand five hundred thirty dollars more. Okay, so what is your question then? Maybe I'm. My question is so anyway. So I said, well, I can't afford that right now for this. Or my, you know, I said, but so they replaced the air conditioning unit, and then, you know, and they did a bunch of. I I have itemized. But I, after two miles away, I could. I had warm air blowing on my air conditioning, the brand new air conditioning unit. Okay. So then, I took it to a private mechanic, and he said, "Yeah," he said. Why all of a sudden I'm leaking uh, green liquid on my, my car? I didn't know. He goes, well, because they, they diagnosed you that you have a uh, bone head gasket, intake manifold gasket. That sound right? Well, it could be, but also your leaking intake manifold gasket could have been what they were talking about. The intake, it's not it's very common on that V6 engine in the Lumina, 3.1 liter probably, the intake manifold gaskets on the front and rear ears or the corners of the manifold, they leak a lot. They'll leak externally, but worse, they'll leak internally, and that coolant goes into the engine, makes a milkshake out of the out of the oil, and you ruin the engine that way. Will it ever go into the combustion chamber? Is that that kind of leak? No, 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 okay. no. Typically not. No, it's it's a it's the water passage, in it, and it's just it's either going externally or it goes typically into the into the crankcase. So that's that could be a problem. You very well could have a blown head gasket, and you simply just need to go to a, another shop, which sounds like you did, and get a second opinion on everything, and have them explain to you how, how do you know that it has a blown head gasket? I don't like that. I think it has a blown head gasket. Well, right. if you think it does, then you I think you need to keep finding until you can tell me. I know it has a blown head gasket. Right. We don't have to guess or be ambiguous. I mean, there is tests for everything, and that was one of the follow-ups I was doing an email this week was, well, is it this or is it that? Well, let's f- figure out what it really is. So I see you pointing over there. What are you pointing at? I'm, just po- <laughs> I'm pointing at Steve. We're going to talk to Steve from Goodyear about his Jaguar S-Type. Steve, you're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. What can we do for you? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm uh, I'm calling. Let me park my vehicle. I'm actually a letter carrier, so I'm... Uh, uh-oh. I'm uh, here in the tin can. <laughs> in the Jeep. Yeah, it's well, it's, it's, uh, I think a Jeep would might be better. But anyways, <laughs> I, uh, I have a, uh, I have a 2001 S-Type Jaguar. And basically the problem that I'm having is uh, I parked on an incline and then the, the gear didn't want to go in from park into reverse. And now the gear shift basically, um, unless you put the emergency brake on, you can't park on an incline because you have to basically push forward on the vehicle so it would release the the gear shift to go into reverse. 
But uh, now the problem that I have, so I, I can get used to pulling the emergency brake before I park anywhere, uh, but now the problem I'm having is, as well, is um, the vehicle, when I go from, when I go to park somewhere, I put the gear shift in the park, and I try to put it in the park, but it doesn't seem to want to catch. You have to do it like three, four times before it actually hits park. Hmm. I think okay. that's an electronic uh, shift mechanism, or is that manual, Dave? Do you I, know? I definitely remember uh, fixing these from time to time, but it is, I, I believe it is a cable, and there is adjustment there. So we've got we have got a cable adjustment issue between the transmission and that shifter itself. So everything's got to be be lined up just right. You gotta be, you've got a shift interlock or a safety device that protects that thing from coming out of park when the car's running and your foot is not on the brake. That's one component. I don't think we're dealing with that, but what happens is those cables stretch over time, and so when you're going to put it in park, it's it's not going far enough. Yeah. So I don't think there's any major adjustment that has to be made. Sometimes the shifter itself can have a component that's worn out, and you need to replace the shifter mechanism. Or a little rubber bushing. A little where rubber grommet will do in. that. Yeah. That definitely happens. So it could be a it could be literally be a fifty cent part. That, yeah. Very likely is a very simple, simple repair. For it, sure. It, it very well could be. So next segment we'll get we got Mark and Eric. We're going to get to you after a quick break. We have open line 602-277-5827, 602-277. KTR, Dave, you're laughing at me. What's going on over there? What do you want to do? The times are different today, so you're yeah, about two minutes early. I was a minute off, and it's not even a hard one. What are you giving me a hard time for? <laughs> He's just trying to bust my chops, trying to make me look bad. He's got hang overhead. You are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. <laughs> Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio, where Matt and I are here for you. Most of the time, not hungover, so help you with the car. If you get in trouble, you keep talking. I know you're trying to gin it up a little bit, no pun intended. But Matt was quite hilarious last night. If you... uh, whatever. <laughs> trying to Look at you, trying to make up stories over here. I'm not making up stories. Anyway, we had an email this week, and we get emails every week at well, Bumper to bumper radio dot com. Was it me that was funny, or was it you with like fifty chicken bones on your plate, scarfing away? That I think that was the funny part. It was good food, and I have been on a diet. And last night I broke every last portion of that diet. <laughs> but, uh, but but I got an email from Heather, and she was in. She had one bad tire, and the tire shop insisted she buy all four tires. And she was she was upset. She felt like I'm a woman. They're taking advantage of me. Why are they making me buy four tires? I obviously only have one bad one. She has a 2005 Ford Escape, which is all-wheel drive, and she does need four tires. Can't buy them one at a time. You well, can if it's a fairly new tire, and there's not going to be much tread variation difference. But really, any more you're buying four tires at a time if you have an all-wheel drive. Well, let's talk about why that is. The, the, if you have different, if you have three old tires and one brand new tire, that brand new tire is going to have a larger rolling diameter as it rolls. The distance traveled will be greater than the other ones, than the other three. So that all four of those tires or wheels are coupled with the transmission and the transfer case that has to transfer that power where it wants it. If those tires are not spinning at the same speed, it freaks the system out. It could be cause a computer issue, a control issue. But they just tear up the transfer case. They come in. I've seen escapes, Jerking. Ford escapes come in where the front transfer case is just melted. And uh, it's just from having different tires. So Subarus. But we even see it with brand new tires. You get a cheap, cheap Charlie set of tires. We have a stagger gauge. I know you have one at your shop, Dave. We measure every, measure the tires. You can have brand new junky tires from Acme Tire. And they're different sizes. I never bought an Acme tire, but well, I have seen. And one thing I, it's on tires, to be saying whatever brand, because I'm not going to do that. from. <laughs> yeah, right. From 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 tire lot to tire lot, there is variation. And on a let's take a Ford Explorer, the Bolton reads if there's more than a half an inch variation, then we've got an issue. So there's four wheel drive and there's all wheel drive. And on four wheel drives, if they're not a full time type of setup and they're not computer engaged, and you actually have selection method where you can just be in two wheel drive. Yeah, then you don't have to buy four at a time. That would be the exception to that. But be careful when you're buying tires because these are costly, costly repairs, certainly more than buying the next three tires. Well, I have an all-wheel drive car, and I got, well, to add insult to injury, we just had a puncture, had a nail. We were fixing it at the shop. New guy punctured the tire. What I have to do? Four tires. Car had 17,000 miles on it. I was not a happy camper. 
but I'm not going to destroy a transfer case. Yeah, get real expensive. So up for this segment, let's go with Mark in surprise on a 2008 Chevrolet Impala. Go ahead, Mark. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Um, first, let me preface telling you that I'm a heavy-duty diesel mechanic. I've been doing that for 16 years, and uh, I know quite a bit about cars, but um, I've got an 08 Impala that at 80,000 miles started downshifting hard in the first year when cold, stopping at a stoplight and uh, took it to the dealer. They said there was nothing wrong. Didn't really do it much very often. And now that it's out of warranty and it's got 135000 on it, it does it quite regularly when cold. And when I mean cold, I mean under 20 miles, you know, it still hasn't completely got up to temperature. So but then it's fine. But when you take off from a light, it'll hard slam down in first. Or if I just grab it manually, and pull it down into first, it's fine. Is that a consecutive stop? So I, I back out of the driveway and I go down the street, and for the next 10 stops, while well, the vehicle's not up to operating temperature, I get this hard. I'm going I'm to call it, is this a 2-1 downshift when you're coming up to a stop? Pretty much. And, in, and you don't really feel it downshift into first. And if I grab it and I pull it into first, I'll take off. Once I get rolling, I pop it up into drive. I'm good to go. But even if I stop at the light and I pull it down into first and then I shift it back into drive and then I take off, it'll still down slam. Hmm. And I've read some stuff online about a pressure control um, unit, the transmission being common with those, I believe. Well, they, they certainly do have an issue with that. And uh, there's a EPC, or electronic pressure control. 08's kind of late model for that. In the earlier 2000, 2001, 2002, there was a ton of problem with that. But there's a, I'm trying to remember the name of the valve that's in there, but it's a its a relay valve for the solenoids that likes to wear out. And so the EPC can't function like it needs to function because it doesn't have the right pressure to it. It's an AFL valve, which is, it stands for uh, hang Don't on my head. <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> Would you just but, stop? Look at people texting. You guys are on oh, over. Oh, oh, no, we're not. <laughs> we're, we're really not. We're pretty mild guys. <laughs> you know, one thing that, that Mark said that it troubles me a little bit, and I just don't know if it's a mixing up of terms, mm-hmm. but he said that they said there was nothing wrong with it. And I think everybody needs to make sure when they go and they have a problem with the car and they say there's nothing wrong with it. Well, let's clarify that. Is there really nothing wrong with a car and it's supposed to downshift hard like this all the time? Is that what you're telling me? Or is it you just can't duplicate the problem? Because we hear that there's nothing wrong with it a lot when there is something wrong with it. Yeah, but I'm going to, I'm going to, on that a little bit, is I'm going to say that automatic transmissions, if you drive from here, here at the station to north, the way north valley, you're going to, the transmission is going to shift up four times and down four times between stoplights. So by the time you get to the north valley, that means the transmission has shifted, oh, 100, 150 times. And what people don't understand is transmissions only shift perfect 90% of the time. The, the more the years go on, the more complex the computer gets, the more complex the valve body gets in order to make this thing shift perfect 100% of the time, and they just don't. So if you're getting an occasional 2-1 harsh downshift every now and then, it's just telling me the transmission's showing its age, but there's nothing fundamentally wrong with it. So, and that's, and that's something we struggle in our business is that people feel these weird shifts and they think something's wrong. I drive a 2011 Honda Element, and if I get in the right throttle position... It has a terrible one-two shift, so I just don't hit that throttle position. That's what happens because there's nothing True. there to fix. And so with transmissions, i got to lower well, the what expectation. What you're talking about is a characteristic, maybe. So there's a fine line there. That's just a characteristic of the car, or is there something wrong with it? But anyway, it's, it's just just make sure you're getting the clear answer. Is there truly nothing wrong, or is that just the way the car is supposed to operate, or is it that you couldn't find it? That was that was my point. So. Okay. So, well, thanks for the call. hope that was helpful for you. Let's go with Dorothy in Scottsdale on a 2013 Lexus. Go ahead, Dorothy. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hello. Hello. Go ahead. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Thank you. Dorothy is my wife. This is my husband. <laughs> okay. We're going to okay. speed you along here because we're right up at the end of the show. Okay. I'll make it short and sweet. We bought a new automobile, and the manual in the service department says have it serviced six months or 5,000 miles, whichever comes first. We will be gone after four months. We leave Arizona for California, and we do it in four more months. Would you prefer we do it before we go four months or when we come back, which will be nine months? I, 
What do you think? Yeah, I I would tend to. I would want, I would probably put three quarters of it or half a tank of gas in the car, and take a make sure you get one good hot trip. Get the car up to operating temperature, drive it, and then park it. Let it sit, and then service it when you get back. Because then you can take it in, get the opportunity to get the tire pressures checked, and and all the things that may deplete while it's sitting for those months while you're gone. But it's not a good idea to do it after the trip. Is that what you're saying? Well, no. He's going to park the car for the. For, yeah. Well, do the I get car. the service done before or after the trip? I do it after, because that's when he's going to start using the car again. That's well, what thanks, I would do. Thanks for sharing your Saturday with us. Hope we lowered your automotive anxieties. To start a relationship with a great shop, bumper to bumperradio.com. If you already have a great shop, stick with them. While you're at bumper to bumperradio.com, be sure to like us on Facebook. Thanks, Peter, for running a great show. I am Dave Riccio, the automotive therapist, and he is Matt Allen. And Tom and Eric, we're going to get you off air. And uh, remember never to text and drive.